One of the features of a dive watch is its unidirectional rotating bezel. Though a lot is said on YouTube and the internet as a whole about dive bezels, much of this information is actually incomplete or even plain wrong. As a scuba diver myself, let me explain exactly how this life-saving feature came about and how you're supposed to use it. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. This channel is dedicated to finding out whether I really do know it all or not. If you enjoy the video, definitely make sure you hit the like button and definitely make sure you subscribe for more of this. Also, I should probably do a little watch check today. <laughs> I'm wearing my favorite watch. It's my Omega Seamaster Pro 300. I've done other videos on this and you can check them out up here if you want to. So definitely do if you have an interest, including I did a complete review of it. So definitely check that out. First, I think it's rather important for us to establish right now that a mechanical dive watch with a rotating bezel is an outdated feature, right? We have, we have these now, we have dive computers, either in the form of a watch or in the form of a hockey puck. Uh, there's a historical reason for this. They are actually drop-in replacements for the original depth gauges that used to be in older dive setups. So that's why they're shaped like this. They're kind of odd shaped, but that's it. But anyway, I think most people nowadays kind of use more of a watch form factor. It's a lot easier, unless you're like a technical diver or something, in which case you use whatever works best and you don't really care what it looks like. Before the mid-1990s or so, however, uh, before computers really started to take over in the scuba diving realm, the depth gauge was actually the primary way of a diver staying safe. So between the air gauge to make sure you had enough air, that was rather important, and the depth gauge, that, that was the combination of things. But the depth gauge doesn't work by itself. It actually needs a time element also, which is where a dive watch comes in. And actually, even now with computer systems and everything that most people use to dive, uh, most often people wear watches as a backup system, or <laughs> perhaps it's a status symbol. It's always nice to wear like a Rolex Submariner or something like that and go like, check out me, I've got a Rolex Submariner. So there were many early dive watches that were waterproof or had some elements of a dive watch, but the original dive watch that everyone registers as the original modern dive watch was the Blancpain 50 Fathoms. Uh, that was the first one that had a rotating bezel. It had, it had waterproofness, it had a very big dial, and it had a rotating bezel. Those are all kind of hallmarks of a dive watch now. And of course, in 1953, when Rolex came up with the Submariner, you know, <laughs> the rest is kind of history, as they say at that point. Uh, one interesting thing is that Omega Seamaster Pro 300, they had Seamasters before, but they weren't actual dive watches. But the original version of this watch, this is the 2018 reimagining of it, but the original version of the Omega Seamaster Pro 300 was actually not until 1957, so it took them a long time to get on the bandwagon. But anyway, the 1950s was when the original dive watch as a modern incarnation came into being. And of course, in the 1960s and 70s, scuba diving took off in a major way. And so it became a super important thing for scuba divers to have. So what are the features of a modern dive watch? Well, you have to have a screw down crown because it's got to be water resistant. I think generally 200 meters is the absolute minimum uh, that is considered to be a true dive watch. Uh, I don't know. I could be wrong about that, but I believe 200. <laughs> it also has to be ISO certified, etc. It's got to have, so obviously it's got to have good water resistance of at least 200 meters. It needs to be luminescent for night diving, right? So it needs to be able to be readable at night. It needs to have a moving second hand or some indication that it is operating. So the last thing you want to do is jump in the water and think that your watch is running and timing and it doesn't actually do anything and you're like, oh crap, it was broken. And of course, it needs to have <laughs> a rotating bezel. So there you go. And we're going to demonstrate that in just a little while. Um, originally, the bezel rotated in both directions, but after a while they realized, and I'll, I'll talk about why in just a minute, but they realized that it needed to rotate in only one direction. So nowadays, of course, many, many, many dive watches, in fact, I think probably almost all, except for maybe someone like Alanga and Zon, um, and I, well, even Patek has a kind of a dive watch. But anyway, except for the kind of high-end, dressy, fancy watch people, almost all watch companies carry at least one dive watch. In addition, many or most startup watch companies that are out there start with a dive watch. <laughs> it's simple, it's iconic, it's very popular, so why not? It's a, it's a perfect combination for your first watch, your first foray out there. All right, so let's talk about how does a dive watch work. I'm going to turn the camera around here in just a second, and I'm going to show you how it works. 
All right, so quick demo time here. Um, <laughs> really, a bezel couldn't be much simpler. I mean, that's the whole point of this, right? It was not designed to be complicated to use. It was designed to be easy. So again, this is my Omega Seamaster Pro 300. The bezel is just the thing that rotates on the outside. And the deal is that you line it up with the... Let's see if I can get it just right. Minute hand, there we go. Okay, so this is a 120 click rotating bezel, which means it's two per minute. So basically you can be accurate down to about 30 seconds here, which you know is adequate for doing a dive or something. So essentially what you do is you set it right there and you read off of the little triangle mark on the minute hand. So that's the way it works. So let's assume that we had set it at, uh, I guess, 425 here. Oh, let's just make it 420, why not, right? <laughs> just for the heck of it. Okay, so we've set it for 420. So what we do now is we look on the outside ring. So instead of 435, we're just approaching 15 minutes right now, right? So 10 minutes, 15 minutes. That's where we're going with that. So it's actually quite a simple process. And again, the whole idea is for this to be a relatively easy... <laughs> if you haven't seen it, watch my review of the Seamaster Pro 300, because I really like this bezel, but I also don't like the fact that it is not coin edge around the edge. So, you know... <laughs> It's, it's good and bad, but anyway, that's the basic way it works. Super simple. You just set the triangle, the pip, to whatever you want it to be, and then you read it off. And so we're at 15 minutes right now, and it will continue going up as time goes on. So one thing that may not have been quite so clear in the demonstration is that you cannot, you can rotate the bezel this way, counterclockwise, but you cannot rotate it the other direction. I'm not going to try to force it because I want to break my watch, but you know, it's got a ratchet system on there so it can only rotate one direction. And what that means is that you can only ever accidentally increase the time. So let me go ahead. Oh, I already had it in the right time. So if we have this thing set here, right, it's currently reading about 49 minutes. And so if I accidentally knocked it counterclockwise, now it reads about 54 minutes. So that's the reason why you need to have that counterclockwise rotating bezel. It can only ever increase the time, it can never decrease the time. So why does a bezel operate this way? Number one, it is not to keep you from running out of air. This has nothing to do with air. <laughs> you have to manage that entirely separately. And that is actually what your pressure gauge is for. Number two, it is not to keep you from going too deep. That is what your depth gauge is for, right? So it doesn't do either of those two things. What it does is it keeps the time and it is kind of like a stopwatch in a way, right? So it's a rudimentary stopwatch. You set it to approximately where it needs to be and you just let it run and it tells you what time it was when you got in the water and how long it's been since you got in the water. That's its primary and only function as a diver. So why does this matter? Diving requires pressurized air, right? If you've ever gotten under a pool or something, or try this sometime, right? You can take a big old tube, like a piece of PVC piping, and you can breathe in that, no problem. And if you go underwater a couple of feet, you can't expand your lungs. You can't take in air because the pressure of the water is too much. By the way, actually don't do this because you'll breathe in carbon dioxide and you could kill yourself. <laughs> so if you want to try this, I don't recommend it, but definitely have somebody on hand to make sure that you're safe. So what that water pressure means is that every 10 meters lower you go, or about 33 feet, you're getting another atmospheric pressure on your chest. And your diaphragm muscles simply aren't strong enough to pull your chest open open at that point. So what you're doing is you're taking air that's like high pressure and you're forcing it into your lungs. That's essentially what scuba diving is. It's self-contained underwater breathing apparatus is what it stands for. So this high pressure air is just air. It's got oxygen and it's got nitrogen in it. The nit the oxygen gets used up by your body, but the nitrogen actually compresses just like in a soda can, right? Or a soda bottle. So if you take a Sprite bottle or something that's like a clear um, carbonated beverage, you can see it. It doesn't look like it has any bubbles in it when it's under pressure. As you start to come back up though, so let's say you go down to 30 meters or something like that, that is an extra three atmospheres of pressure on your body, which means the air is being pumped in at over three times atmospheric pressure, which means it's super pressurized and it started to dissolve into your bloodstream. So as you start to come up, if you come up really fast and you're not paying attention, that nitrogen in your bloodstream will actually turn into bubbles. Just like as if you opened up a soda bottle, right? It goes like that, everything fuzzes out and there's all of a sudden bubbles everywhere. They get stuck in your joints, they can get into your brain, they can get into your heart, they can get into other organs, they can cause severe pain, 
It can cause permanent damage to your body and it can even kill you. So what do you do to combat this? You do two things. You come up very, very slowly. <laughs> so that's number one. And number two, you stay down for a certain maximum amount of time that is determined by the depth that you go down to. So, aha, right? <laughs> that's why you need a watch. You have to know exactly how long you've been down. It's critical for you surviving the scuba diving trip. I don't want to make it sound like scuba diving is scary. It's actually a really lovely, lovely thing. But, you know, <laughs> considering you're breathing in high pressure air, you really, really do have to be careful and you have to be cognizant of the fact that all this is going on. Of course, the reason why people use dive computers now as opposed to watches is because it kind of handles all this on its own and it tells you all the bad things that are going on if they are. Generally speaking, I've been on 110 dives or something in my life. It's very rare that anything goes wrong. It's all good. But, you know, these things are critical, right? <laughs> you can die if you do this wrong, so you really do have to know what you're doing. How do you know how long you're allowed to stay down? Well, U.S. Navy and other researchers in the 1940s and 50s came up with a series of tables for how long a person can safely stay down without having to spend significant time underwater decompressing, right? When you hear about decompression dives, what that means is you've been down long enough that you've absorbed enough nitrogen into your bloodstream that you have to stay underwater for a period of time. If you're doing sport diving, you should never be in a decompression situation. And what that means is that you can always start upwards and get to the surface without stopping if you need to. Generally, people do it slowly and generally they take a three minute safety stop, but you don't have to, right? So if there's kind of an emergency and you need to get out of the water quickly, you can do so. If you get to a decompression phase, you have to stay underwater. If you come up, you could get yourself injured or killed. So that's the difference between sport diving and decompression technical diving. And by the way, decompression diving is the topic for another video. If anybody wants to see that, let me know. So the profile is before the dive, <laughs> at least if you're not going to use a computer, if you're going to use the old traditional way, you will look at a table that will tell you how long you're allowed to spend underwater. Okay. And then what you do is you dive that profile, right? So if you're going to go down to 25 meters or something like that, then you look at the table, you determine where 25 meters is, you determine how long you're allowed to stay under the water, you set your watch as you commence the dive, you monitor the watch and of course your air gauge to make sure you don't run out of air, but you look at the pressure gauge, you make sure you've never gone too low and you look at your watch and you make sure you haven't stayed down too long. And as you get close to that point, you start back up again. And that's kind of the end when you sort of turn off your watch, right? So the dive profile officially ends as you start to rise back up again. This does, of course, require that you remember to set the watch at the beginning, right? And of course, you have to look at it throughout the dive to make sure that you haven't stayed under too long. But that's, you know, those are just parts of things that you do as a scuba diver. You're just kind of paying attention to those things in the background. And thus effectively, the bezel, like I said, is a rudimentary stopwatch. That's what it's doing. It's determining how long you've been underwater. And it's making sure, along with the tables, that you don't stay under too long and end up in a decompression situation. That's crucially what it's designed for. And actually, if you do end up in a decompression situation, you can use the watch to, again, determine how long you have to stay at each depth in order to decompress. So let's think about this. If you set this incorrectly, or if you bump it to another time, or you don't use it right, or you can't read it properly because maybe it's too dark or something like that or bad design, then you can stay under too long and you could need decompression. And if you don't realize that, you can actually be injured or die from that. And thus we have why the bezel only rotates one way. <laughs> it can only ever increase the amount of time you think you've been underwater. And that's okay, right? The worst thing that'll happen if you think you've been under five minutes longer than you have is that you'll come up early and your dive will be a little shorter. If you accidentally made it less time and you thought that you were under for less time, you could kill yourself. Also, the dive watch time plus your diving tables can calculate your surface interval and future dives that day, which gets more complex, but all of it works in the same manner with the watch. If anybody's interested, I kind of might do an episode on that, but honestly, um, <laughs> I don't want to be the guy telling you how to do this stuff because you're supposed to take a dive training class to do that. And it's actually super critical that you do that. Uh, again, like I said, if you screw this stuff up, you can injure yourself or kill yourself. So it's not a joke. It's, you know, it's, it's really fun to go scuba diving, but you need to know what the hell you're doing. So when I started looking into this video, I thought it was going to be like a three minute video, but as you can tell, it's significantly longer. It turns out that this really, really simple looking and simple behaving watch complication 
has actually been thought about very carefully as it's a life-saving device. In fact, there is an ISO standard, which is ISO 6425, that has to be met in order to make this an official dive watch. So that's really important. And if you care about having an official dive watch, you're going to want one that says divers or that it's ISO certified or something like that. Just make sure it's ISO 6425 because there's two ISO standards and one of them is not for dive watches. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that episode and I hope it was informative and maybe it corrected some misconceptions that you had about dive watches. If you did enjoy it, definitely make sure you hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more episodes like this. And also be sure to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.